Let the church say amen. 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 It is a blessing. Mm -hmm. It is a blessing that the Lord has allowed us to see this day, has permitted us to be here this morning. Amen. amen. You have got to appreciate when God gives you a blessing that no man can take. Amen. 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 It is good to be here this morning. Good to have all of you here present with us this morning as we seek to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Amen. just want to remind you of a few things first and foremost. Um, 3.30 worship service is back on the schedule this month going forward. Um, we had some excellent times uh, last month, didn't we? Amen. Excellent fellowship at Clayton on the fourth Sunday and last Sunday at Sunset Road. It was a good fellowship as well. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so we thank the Lord. We thank the Lord for his multitude of blessings as we continue to fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Brother Ty Johnson blessed us with a powerful word last week, didn't he? Amen. 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 He showed up there. That's my brother. Huh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He, he did the next day. He, he did good with the word. The next day he cooked some baked beans. Love Jesus. Mm, I would have brought some, but uh, they done. Mm, I ain't got time. I couldn't share it this time. Lord, forgive me. It was, <laughs> but he, he did a remarkable job last week. And we certainly appreciate him for that. Amen. 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 Just want to call your attention just for a moment. Uh, please note, if you have time, make sure you check out the website. www.cnjacoc.com. Uh, it is on your bulletin as well. Uh, we've had some uh, changes, uh, some good changes that have taken place. A new logo as well that's up there. Uh, we're going to show all of that, of course, here when we have our congregational meeting uh, a little bit later on of uh, this year. We'll share everything. Everything. Amen. 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 It is good to be here. It is good to be here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. I'm thankful to the brothers who, who Led us in our worship service. Um, did an excellent job, Brother Mervyn. Appreciate you greatly. Brother John, Brother O, appreciate y'all very greatly. Just leading us as we seek to approach the throne of God. Amen. 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 Now for, now for the word of God. The Bible, in Genesis chapter 41. I'll reread a portion just for emphasis sake. Verses 14 and following. The Bible again says, Then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. And when he had shaved himself, changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, but no one can interpret it, and I have heard it said about you that you, when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph then answered Pharaoh and said, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. So Pharaoh spoke to Joseph. In my dream, behold, I was standing on the bank of the Nile. And behold, seven cows, fat and sleek, came up out of the Nile and they grazed in the marsh grass. Lo, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt, such as I had never seen for ugliness in all the land of Egypt. And the lean and ugly cows ate up the first seven fat cows, yet when they had devoured them, it could not be detected that they had been devoured, for they were just as ugly as before, and then I awoke. I saw also in my dream, and behold, seven ears full of good, full and good, came up on a single stalk. And lo, seven ears withered, thin, and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up after them. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears. Then I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Now Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has told Pharaoh what he is about to do. Church, this week we continue in our series on stewardship, giving, and offering. Here in the text, 
we see an odd situation involving the great person from the scriptures known as Joseph. Here in the text, though, we see a part of the story of Joseph that begins his ascent as a great leader in the land of Egypt. And the reason is because he taught a strategy of excellent stewardship. If you would lend me your heart and ears to this thought, just in case, just in case, in our previous weeks dealing with the series Stewardship Giving and Offering, we have focused primarily on stewardship. We've examined the importance of planning, setting aside and setting up how we are to do things in accordance with 1 Corinthians 16 verses 1 and 2. We spoke on making room by taking care and planning our finances and making room to give to the Lord. Amen. We examined the importance of working, planning for today, tomorrow, and the future in accordance with Proverbs 6, verses 6 through 11. We spoke on planning and planning to give to the Lord as well. It is my hope that these sermons and this series is a blessing to you and to your home as you manage your finances, as it is a practical information to help you manage your household. If you missed any of these sermons or seek to study them a little further, I encourage you to visit our website and check out recordings and under there. But this week we examine a portion of the story of Joseph. Up to this point to remind us of his story, Joseph is one of the 12 sons that Israel or Jacob has. But his 12 brothers, they, his 11 brothers, they hated Joseph. Why did they hate him? They hated him because he was a dreamer. And God gave him two very real dreams where uh, uh, the interpretation of them was that his brothers would bow to him. And his brothers hated him for it because they said, who are we to bow down to you? He had another dream and it was his parents and his brothers, they bowed down to him. And they looked at him and they said, who are we to bow down to you? Well, the result was that uh, uh, Israel, or Jacob, he kept these things in mind that Joseph was sharing. And as he shared these things, his brothers became more and more jealous of him. So here it is one day, they're out at the marketplace, and, and Joseph goes to find them. And they look and they say, here comes this dream. And so the mentality is that they have, they say, we're going to kill him. And Reuben said, no, I don't kill him. Because Reuben said, Reuben said, now we can't have his life on our hands. Now we're not going to do that. And what his brothers did was they ended up selling him into the possession of the Midianites. Well, the Midianites, they went down and they went to Egypt and they sold him into the possession of one of the captains in Egypt known as Potiphar. And Potiphar, his wife, was interested in Joseph. Well, but Joseph, you see, God still had faith on Joseph. While he was sold into slavery, Potiphar made him captain or made him chief over his household. He was his chief steward over all of his household. But Potiphar's wife was interested in Joseph. Amen. And she's interested in Joseph, but Joseph refuses her advances. Well, it so happened they were alone one time, and, and she uh, threw herself on Joseph, and Joseph ran and left this coat. Mm -hmm. Lord, that's a sermon right there. Sometimes you got to leave your coat. Run away from sin. Amen. Leave your coat and run away from sin. Well, he left the area. And when he left the area, left his coat, but she still accused him of rape. And here it is, Joseph ends up in jail. Well, when Joseph is jail, in jail, God has favor on him once again and says, mm, and he gets put as the chief steward of the prison. Ain't that something? God consistently had favor on him. Well, he meets Pharaoh's baker and Pharaoh's cupbearer. And they both have dreams and they say, Joseph, we need these dreams interpreted or can you interpret these dreams? And when Joseph interpreted the dreams, he said to the baker, Pharaoh's going to kill you. He said to the cupbearer, Pharaoh's going to restore you. But when he restores you, make sure you tell him about me in this jail cell. Well, the baker is executed. The cupbearer is restored, but he forgets about Joseph for two full years. <clears throat> And then Pharaoh has a dream that cannot be interpreted. The dream is noted in verses 17 through 24. That there were seven fat cows 
eaten by seven scrawny cows, but they remained scrawny and sickly looking. These were particular in their scrawniness. Verse 19, Pharaoh says, I had never seen such ugliness in all the land of Egypt. Well, Joseph then blesses him and he shares the interpretation of the dream. He says in verses 26 through 31, the seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one and the same. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, and the seven thin, scorched by thin ears, scorched by the east wind, will be seven years of famine. It is as I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Behold, seven years of great abundance are coming in all the land of Egypt. And after them, seven years of famine will come. And all the abundance will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. And the famine will ravage the land. So that the abundance will be unknown in the land because of that subsequent famine. For it will be very severe. The good, the fat cows represent, and ears of corn represent seven years. The ugly Cows represent seven years, and he states it will be seven years of great, great abundance, but it will be followed by seven years of greater famine in Egypt, so severe that Egypt would forget about the years of abundance. Joseph then says in verse 32 that God will bring it about quickly. Church, have you ever been in a situation where you had it so good? Y'all been there? Where you had it good? Everything was blessed, everything was working right, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it comes a, such a family-type situation that you forget about what you had so good. Amen? Y'all been there before? Hmm. The blessing is that Joseph didn't just share what the interpretation of the dream was. But you see, the Lord blessed Joseph with wisdom. He interpreted Pharaoh's dream, but Pharaoh has a problem. How do I handle the famine that's coming? So the famine that's coming, Joseph gives him the breakdown, and he says to him, in verses 34 through 36, let Pharaoh take action to appoint overseers in charge of the land. And let him exact a fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven years of abundance. Then let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain for food in the cities under Pharaoh's authority and let them guard it. Let the food become as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which will occur in the land of Egypt so that the land will not perish during the famine. The Bible says in three that Joseph says three things to him. He said exact a fifth or 20% of the food supply. He says store it up in the cities under authority and he says let the food be a reserve. The result was that Egypt not only survived the famine, they supported people that came that were in need as well. Amen. Like Joseph's family, Israel and his brothers. The purpose, you know what, this is a blessing. The purpose of Joseph's trial and tribulation was to save his family during this famine. You know there's a sermon right here, amen? Joseph goes through a lot of stuff, but the whole purpose of him going through everything was so that he could bless somebody else, amen? You ever been in a situation where trials and tribulations, they hurt, they're bad, they tough, but you go through it because God is blessing you to bless somebody else based on your trials and tribulations, amen? amen. Peter went through some serious situations, but God blessed him to go through it so that he could show that the Gentiles, God was accepting of them too. Paul went through some serious situations. He was in prison twice. He was shipwrecked. He was stoned. He went through all of these things. Why? So that he could spread the word of God even farther. Sometimes your trials and tribulations are so that God can bless you. And bless you to bless someone else. Amen? Amen. But that's not our focus this morning. question we have is how does this part of Joseph's story apply to us? There are some principles as we are focusing and dealing on stewardship that we can pull from the story 
that will help us in the long run. Before we get into that, I want to share that emergencies arise all the time. Amen? Let me be clear on what an emergency is. In this context of the scripture, the emergency was famine. What actually helps us understand in today's time what an emergency is. You see, famine is defined as a situation in which many people do not have enough food to eat. A great shortage. Amen? Amen. There are certain things about famines that apply in our lives now. Number one, they are inevitable. Amen? You can't pick when a famine shows up. You heard what I said? They are inevitable. You can't avoid them. While contextually we are dealing with a seven-year famine, emergency times or famine-type situations have no time limit or set duration. You know, I, I share with you as, as a matter of testimony, I've been unemployed before. Has anyone in here been unemployed before? Amen. I, I've been employed, unemployed at one time for one month. I've been employed at another time for six months. I've been unemployed another time for seven months. I've been unemployed another time for nine months. I've been employed and been minimized, meaning I was working full time. I worked on the weekend, so I worked from Friday 5.30 until 3.30 each morning. 5.30 p.m., 5 o'clock p.m. to 3.30 each morning. I did that the entire weekend. And then all of a sudden, I wouldn't take a promotion. And so they said, we have another job for you. It's driving a handicapped van. I said, okay, cool. But they didn't tell me. They were reducing me from 40 hours in a weekend to one shift of 10 hours per week. And I had that for seven months. It was that November of that year that I married Dominique. Can you imagine marrying a man that's only making $100 per week? I have been underpaid. You know, family will make you do some things. There's that, that saying, y'all know the saying, a man got to do what a man got to do. Y'all familiar with it, right? Well, I, I, I'm qualified to be a sales manager. I'm qualified to be a manager of a store. I'm qualified to do a number of things and to run sales. But when the going got tough, Ken Spence still had to work. I worked as a janitor cleaning up special victims unit in Philadelphia. I'm just telling you, a man got to do what a man got to do. Y'all get what I'm saying? Amen. Making a small amount of money, smaller than I've made before, but you know what a man got to do, what a man has to do. Amen. I've been underpaid where I was answering phones for $7 an hour, begging for money for a company that doesn't even exist anymore. Has anybody been in a situation like this? Amen? I share all of this to say that I'm 33 years old right now. And most of what I've shared took place between the ages of 29 and 31 and 18 and 19. That's less than three years. Famine can show up at any time and take any duration. It can show up several different times in our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Famines can be severe. The scripture in verse 31, 30 and 31 says... And after them, seven years of famine will come, and all the abundance will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine will ravage the land, so that the abundance will be unknown in the land because of that subsequent famine. The Bible says famine will ravage or destroy the land. While I'm here, let me explain one thing. Famines are not personally induced. Amen? Hmm. What I mean is, you don't control when it happens, how it happens, or how severe it gets. Amen? Amen? Famines happen. It might be getting fired for a false reason. However, we need to do our best when those situations arise. Amen? I look sometimes at Shakira's example, being fired falsely from Walmart. Well, she did what she had to do. Amen? She started working for Uber. Amen? You do what you have to do. Well, let me go a little bit further. Famines, however, all of this brings us to our next point. That famines can be prepared for. Amen? Verses 34 through 36 of our text says, Let 
Pharaoh take action to appoint overseers in charge of the land and let him exact a fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven years of abundance. Then let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain for food in the cities under Pharaoh's authority and let them guard it. Let the food become as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which will occur in the land of Egypt so that the land will not perish during the famine. Now the proposal seemed good to Pharaoh and to all of his servants. Well, Joseph breaks down a plan, a budget, a strategy of how to prepare for the famine. Amen? The first thing that he does in this section of scripture is note the importance of the fact that the years of abundance come before the years of famine. Before we go into depth of his plan, you have to be made aware that when you're not in crisis mode, that is the time to prepare for famine times or emergency times. Amen? The unfortunate thing that tends to happen in our society is that we work from paycheck to paycheck and we set nothing aside. Or as Proverbs 6 that we examined two weeks ago said, that we make no provisions for the future. Being a good steward of what God has given to us helps us continually live on this earth peaceably. So I want to share with you principle. Joseph shares a strategy with Pharaoh in three simple steps. I want to share each one with you. The first thing that Joseph says is he says, exact a fifth or 20% of the food supply. The principle is that we save a portion or save a portion of your income when you have it. Amen? While 20% is a sensible number, there is no command here in the scripture. What we draw from the text is a principle that can help us when particular famines arise in our lives. The principle that I would like to share with you is first you have to analyze your own finances, right? You have to create a plan or a budget for your household. You have to set aside the Lord's offering first as 10%. We'll get later on. We'll get in depth in that as we go further in the series. And then figure out what is reasonable for yourself. For some, 5% is reasonable at first. Amen? For some, it may not seem like much at first, but little pennies add up. For some, 10% is reasonable. And for some, 20% is reasonable. But when you pick a percentage... Pick the percentage and stick with it. Amen? That makes sense? I hope it does. I hope it does. The second third principle that we get from the scripture, the second thing that Joseph says is he says, store it up in the cities under authority and guard. The principle we put here, and I, and I, I want to give more emphasis to this, he says, we derive and pull from it, put it in a savings account. Amen? Each, if you have a checking account, normally they come with a savings account. If it doesn't, set one up at your bank. Normally there may be a maintenance fee, but there are ways that that can be avoided. Transfer money into your savings account each time you get paid, or at least once per week. If you have a bank that will only allow a certain amount of transfers, you got to be diligent. It says guarded. That means you got to be dedicated to this thing. If it's only two times a month you can do it, then you do it. But set aside something for famine time. For famine time. Amen? The third thing he says, he says, let the food be a reserve. Well, what's the principle? Don't spend it at all for any other reason than emergency or famine type situations. This money set aside is for emergency or famine situations. This money is not, well, since nothing happened to me in the last year, I can treat myself. Make sense? Because a famine will always arise. Can I give an example? Two weeks ago, I made the statement that uh, there are some individuals who know Bible. And because they know Bible, what they do is they, 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 they have looked at it, examined, understand principles, and applied principles in their life. 
Some other individuals, will they share the information, somebody else will take the information, and sometimes they'll put it in a book. And you go to the book, look at the book, study the book, and you get the principle. There are some people in this world who don't know who Christ is, have no respect for his word, but they understand biblical principle from another source. And when they understand it, they apply it, and they're excellent stewards of what God has given them. I have an example. I met an individual when I was in college, my economics professor. I'll never forget this man. Because he practiced this principle that we're looking at in the scripture. And he understood it from when he was somewhere in his 20s up until the point that he was when I met him in his 50s. And he was a nerdy type guy. I'm a nerd, so we buy, we just, we just clicked. Nerds do that. He and I, we get to talking, or he shares with the whole class, but he and I, we talk a little bit further. He said he was working and he understood the principle, so he took an amount from his paycheck and he put it in a savings account. He took an amount every time he got paid and threw it in a savings account as an emergency fund because he knew sooner or later something bad going to happen. Amen? So he follows that principle and he does this for several years. Like I said, from his 20s to his 50s. He did this consistently over and over and over again and then one day he ends up with a major health situation. He can't work. He's out of work for nine months. Comes back to his job, they say we couldn't hold it for you. Short-term disability open, we ain't got no long term. So he had no work. His wife was holding down the fort, paying his hospital bills and paying for their living. Now he was an economics man. So they lived off of fifty thousand dollars a year and she had to take care of everything because he wasn't making no money. Well, he goes and shops and applies for a few jobs, he can't find any work. So finally, he said, you know what, why don't I look at this emergency account? He goes to this emergency account, he's been depositing money in it for years, never took a look at it. When he goes to the emergency account, he says, listen, well, my wife makes this much, I make, would make this much, and so we only lived off of fifty or forty thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars a year. I don't know if I have much in my emergency account. So you know what? We're only going to live on forty thousand dollars a year. If she commits this much, I'll commit this much from my emergency account. He never looked at it. He gets to the bank, finds out how much is in it, and has roughly three hundred thousand dollars in the bank as an emergency fund and lives off of only 40,000 every year. He did that for three to four years and then somebody from DeVry called him up and he got a job as a teacher. He stopped touching it and just started doing the same system. When he got his paycheck, he just threw it right there because he knew something was going to come and when it would come, he knew that the emergency family fund would be there. You see, this man didn't believe in God when I met him. He's my economics professor. And this is biblical principle. But he didn't realize where he got it from. He didn't realize whoever he learned it from where they got it from. You see, I share all of this with you just to share one particular point. That God wants us to be good stewards of what we have. Amen? This is not prosperity gospel. This is principle that we understand from the Word of God that helps us in our day-to-day -day living. Amen? I personally feel that God has blessed us with the ability to manage all that He has given to us. Amen? And if, what sense does it make if God gave us something that we don't take full advantage of His Word? His Word tells us how to live. His Word is filled with so much wisdom. Why not use the same wisdom of the scriptures to govern how we manage what God has given to us? Amen? I hope this is a blessing to you. I really hope this is a blessing to you. I'll share with you now, if you're here, you're not a member of the Lord's church, why not start with Him today? 
You know, one of the, the things I don't want anyone to take home is that God blesses us with this wisdom. We do it all family situation. Okay, we're thankful. God blesses us with the wisdom. And then we get into this mindset that it's us that helped us in this future situation. Nah, because God blessed you today. Amen? And if God bless you today, that means God bless you today. And if you do do what the Bible says or take the principle from the scriptures and apply it, that means that God blessed you in the future. You know, one of the most blessed things that, 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 that I often sometimes think about is God has brought us a mighty long way. No matter where you are in your life, no matter what the situation is, God has always been there for us. Amen? There have been some situations, Lord, sometimes I sit back and I think on how God has blessed Sister Wilma and her family. And y'all talk to Sister Wilma, she tell you her story. But when you sit there and you realize, you know what, that when God is in the blessing business, you don't focus on what you have in terms of, I'm going to be the reason now. You realize God blessed you with everything now so that you could be blessed later and that you could bless somebody else. Amen? So it only makes sense that when we look at family, you know, I'm glad that when family situations have come up in time past, I always had an advocate where I could go, Lord, help me. Amen? Y'all been there? That, that ability to just say, Lord, I need help and I need it now. Lord, that, that says something. To be able to reach out and cry out to the Father. Lord, I can tell you right now, there are some things right now. Lord, it's just, oh, uh, Lord, Amos says it's like you, you ran from a lion, ran into a bear, leaned on the wall, and your hand got bit by a snake. No matter which way you turn, it's always something. It's always something that can happen. And the only way to get through this life is to have a relationship with God. Does that make sense? Amen. If your relationship with God ain't with your relationship, look, 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 let me talk about relationship for a minute. Because I, I've grown very, very, very weary. We understand relationship when it comes to boyfriend, girlfriend. When it comes to husband, wife. When it comes to good friend and good friend. When it comes to brother and brother and sister and sister, when it comes to cousin, when it comes to uncle and aunt, we understand relationship and anything. But when it comes to God, we start Amen. playing games. Amen. Amen. Oh, I got a relationship with God. Well, God know my heart. You know what? You ought to be scared God knows your heart. Amen. Amen. Because if you know your heart, that means he knows what you really think. Amen. I know what I want to do and I want to serve God, but I want to do what I want to do. Amen. But hold up, if you got a relationship, look what God said, John, in 5, John 15, verse 14, he says, you are my friend if you do what I command. But if you don't have that real relationship, you're playing with this thing. Amen. And it frustrates me all the time to meet so-called Christians that ain't got no respect for God's word. Sometimes I'm like, just shut up, don't tell nobody you're a Christian. Because, Lord, then they're going to come in and talk about, I really don't want to deal with all these hypocrites. need to calm down for me that I'll be so wise. But a relationship with God is not something you just cater to twice a week. It's a daily, continuous interaction. Lord Dominique and I would not have a relationship if I only said I love you on Sundays and Wednesdays. I sometimes wonder why is it that the rest of the world says that you can have a relationship and only know in two days a week. Some of us would not have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a cousin or an uncle if we kept all of our relationships the same way we treat God. Lord of mercy. So I share with you this morning. If you don't have a relationship with God, the blessing is that before you leave here today, you can have a relationship with him. Yeah. And the best part about a relationship with God is that you can start over in your relationship with him. Amen? Amen. He says, he who is born, he who is born of the water and the spirit will be born again, can enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of heaven. Amen. You know, I had a situation this week where my phone, last two weeks ago, my phone acted up to the extent that I couldn't do uh, anything with my phone. 
I woke up in the middle of the night, my phone had just kept restarting. 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 You know, it's one of those situations where it, it, it relates to, to a person. Well, well, I'm going to do better next week. I'm going to just start over. I'm going to just start over. And every time you start over, the problem is that the memory, the RAM, the everything, the information that's on the phone is jacked up. And it needs a clean reset. My phone kept resetting. And no matter what I did when the phone was operating for the few seconds that it was, it would not stop restarting. Something was wrong. So I get online. I do some reading. I get online, I do some reading, and when I did some reading, I found out the only way to fix the problem was to reset, not restart the phone. So here it is that, that's cool. here it is that the phone needed a reset in order for everything on the phone to operate right. But it couldn't operate right without the reset. Because when it restart, the old RAM held old information. And so the old information kept it doing the same thing over and over and over again. Sometimes, if y'all get what I'm talking about, you have an individual that wants to serve God, but the problem is old programming, old information is stuck right here. And so the individual keeps going to the same places, keeps doing the same things keeps up the same activity, keep having the same behavior, the same character, and wonder why things can't get right. So every week, every day, it's just a restart. But God is saying, nah, you need to do a reset. First thing I had to do when I read the manual was I had to go into safe mode, and I had to clear out the RAM. The RAM was the old behavior. The RAM was the old characteristics. The RAM was the old memory. The RAM was everything it used to do. All the programming it obtained over all of this time. And when I realized, it cleared all that information out. Because I'm getting ready for a reset. Sometimes some of us, what we got to do when you've heard the word and you believe the word, you got to repent. Amen? Amen. You got to get rid of, repent is simply turning from an old way of thinking, old programming, old memory, all foolishness and just turning to God and say, I'm going to live a new, well that's repentance. But the phone needs a reset. The phone needs a reset. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with God, then why don't you get a reset? The Bible says in Mark 16, 16, he that believes and is baptized, we got the pool back there, will, will be saved. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who disobeys, he who disbelieves will be condemned. You know the best thing about it? When I reset my phone, everything went back to its first iteration, which meant it was like my phone was brand new. Lord God is so good. If you're born again, it's like you're brand new. Y'all follow what I'm saying? It is a blessing to be born again, to believe and be back. Amen? Amen. Listen, if you're here and you need to start a relationship with God, you need a reset, why don't you come? In a moment, we're going to stand and sing. But if you're here and you're already a Christian, you've already had your reset. You know the blessing about being in Christ? 1 John 1 verse 7 says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Christ continually cleanses us. Continually cleanses us. It's a fresh start with Jesus. Amen? And that's the blessing of being his child, that his blood continues to clean us. Listen, if you need prayer for whatever is going on wrong in your life, for whatever is happening in your life, we're going to stand, we're going to sing the hymn of invitation. But if today you want to start a relationship with him, come on. We're going to stand and sing and give you opportunity to put him on in baptism. As together we stand.